Hey animal enthusiasts and fellow herpetologists, it's Joel here and today we're going to go over all about the coast garter snake and set up a paludarium for one. Let's get into it. The coast garter snake, Thamnophis elegans terrestris, is a subspecies of the western terrestrial garter snake and is endemic to California. Because there are so many species of garter snakes, identification with a taxonomic key can be helpful. This often involves looking at the number of upper or lower labial scales and comparing the size of the front and rear chin shields, among other features. Generally speaking, Thamnophis elegans is a medium-sized slender snake reaching between 18 to 43 inches in length. They have a head not much wider than the neck with keeled dorsal scales. The coloration and pattern is highly variable, but there is usually a yellow dorsal stripe running down the back with another stripe along the bottom of each side. The sides have black, checkered spots, and sometimes with a reddish ground color, creating a black and red pattern. In terms of behavior and activity, they are diurnal and found in woodlands, grasslands, coniferous forests, dunes, brushlands, and generally within close areas of ponds or flowing water. They also have one of the most diverse diets of any snake species, with prey including snails, slugs, earthworms, leeches, fish, tadpoles, frogs, salamanders, lizards, other snakes, small birds, and small mammals such as mice. They have even been found consuming the California newt, Terica terosa, which is extremely poisonous and deadly to most predators. The relationship between garter snakes and toxic newts is a prime example of an evolutionary arms race, as a snake tries to build resistance to the tetrodotoxin while the newts try to develop a stronger poison against the snakes. Some evidence has suggested that garter snakes can retain the deadly neurotoxin found in the skin of newts for several weeks after ingestion, making the snakes poisonous to predators. It is extremely rare for a snake to be poisonous, and reptiles in general are never truly poisonous. On the other hand, they have a duver noise gland that produces a mild venom used to subdue prey, which is generally harmless to humans. They are rear fanged or opisthoglyph, with enlarged teeth at the rear of the mouth which conducts the venom. Other interesting facts are that they mate in the spring and are ovoviviparous. This means that after mating, the female will carry the eggs internally until she gives live birth in the late summer. The garter snake we will be building a paludarium for was actually captive born, but this setup will try to mimic its natural habitat in the wild as close as possible. Since this is a juvenile, a 15 gallon enclosure is adequate. Since this specific tank was once used, the first thing I did was to test for leaks. Once there were no leaks, I used sponges to create a barrier and false bottom for the terrestrial region and mark the height for the background. Since I will be adding a waterfall feature, I also got an idea for where I will be placing the pump. Once that was in order, it was time to work on the background. I used this vertical cork tile and cropped it so that it fit horizontally. The excess cut pieces were then used to create a space for the waterfall pump. I did this by siliconing one piece to the glass side of the tank and used black expanding foam to connect and fill in the gaps. To make it more naturalistic, I spread some sphagnum moss over it. Once the foam and silicone cured, I placed the sponges back and marked their location so I could silicone them down. I then placed back the waterfall pump and used hydroballs to create the drainage layer. On the surface of the hydroballs, I added a small layer of lava rocks. All of this was then covered with mesh to prevent the substrate from entering the drainage layer. To cover up this drainage layer, I siliconed rocks and pebbles all over the mesh, which also provided structure, support, and the barrier to prevent substrate from falling into the aquatic region. The next step was to work on the waterfall. I used a flat rock to create a platform and underneath it, I placed a magnetic mushroom ledge typically used for geckos so the water would trickle down. I then tested the pump to make sure the water actually flowed and placed one last pointed rock at the bottom so it would flow into the aquatic region. I also siliconed smaller rocks and pebbles around the edges so that it would flow properly. Next, I placed the substrate, which was a mix of cocoa fiber and repti soil, and planted a fern. I used moss as an extra buffer around the edge of the rocks to prevent more substrate from falling into the water. I also placed a piece of wood for the snake to bask on. To prevent the snake from escaping and from entering the waterfall section, I sprayed expanding foam over it. Once it cured, I trimmed it so that the lid would fit perfectly and have no chance of the snake getting over it. 
Afterwards, I added this root branch for the snake to climb in and out of the water. In the terrestrial region, I added leaf litter and glacier isopods, since this will be a bioactive enclosure. I also released a lot of springtails to prevent mold growth. To hide that extra space in the back, I placed this Anubias plant with some larger rocks. I did one small water change to remove tannins and added some guppies. Additionally, I added some azola fern and duckweed to the water to control nitrates and make the aquatic region look more naturalistic. This is what it ended up looking like and it was finally time to add the garter snake. Initially, the snake was pretty nervous as this was its first time ever seeing a live plant and real substrate as well as go swimming. I also got to check and make sure my preventative measures work so the snake doesn't escape. After calming down, the snake finally spent time exploring its new enclosure. My hope with this paludarium is to offer hunting enrichment since they naturally try to catch fish and are more semi-aquatic compared to other colubrids. Aside from that, these snakes are relatively easy to care for. In terms of heating and lighting, a basking spot of 85 to 88 degrees Fahrenheit is ideal, with the cool side around 72 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Night temperatures can be around 68 to 72 degrees Fahrenheit. An overhead basking lamp is ideal to provide heat. UVB bulbs aren't strictly necessary, but I usually recommend using a T5 strip light for overall health around 8 to 12 hours a day. As mentioned previously, they have a wide ranging diet so they should be offered a variety of foods including night crawlers, frozen rodents, and fish. Avoid feeder goldfish since they contain thiaminase, which depletes vitamin B1. Juveniles can be fed every 4 to 5 days and adults every 7 to 10 days. Make sure to spot clean feces and soiled substrate and do water changes once a week. In terms of handling, these are a higher stress species so I would recommend just observing them from a distance. There's no need to handle them unless you're doing a physical checkup or transferring them. So yeah guys, that's pretty much everything you need to know about the Coast Guard snake, as well as the basic care for them. If you like this video and want to see more reptile content, please make sure to like and subscribe and let me know in the comments if you have any suggestions. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye!